let's uh, open this up for a little bit of a Q&A. You guys can ask uh, any questions that you want to uh, me or Silent Mike or even any of the guys that you saw lift. So let's start off a Q&A. Who's got some fucking questions? Anybody? Anybody? I know you motherfuckers are going to come up to me afterwards and be like, I had a question, but I didn't want to ask in front of the group. That's how you guys sound. All right, all right. National deadlift, uh, how do you keep that lower back straight? I know he, Emilio over there was uh, rounding the top of his back, right. it was okay, so you can flex those lats when you get up in the pole, but how do you keep that lower back straight? That's been an issue for me, for my yeah, conventional. Yeah, you're gonna have to, uh, he's kind of asking the question of, you know, how do you get your lower back flat if your arms are shorter? And the answer is you're gonna have to really pull on the bar hard, and you're gonna have to work on trying to sink your hips down maybe a little bit lower than the next person. So Silent Mike can just kind of demonstrate on this part here. Each, each person's going to be a little different. Some guys that are, uh, some people that are built, what's that? Some people that are built a little bit more squatty, uh, shorter arms, kind of thicker legs. Uh, they're going to have to really pull on the bar to get themselves in a position. They have to utilize the bar to get themselves in the right spot. So see how he's using the bar to pull himself in a position? That's exactly what you want to try to do. You want to come up and do one? We'll pull a little bit of weight off here. Another way, another way to do it is um, if you lift uh, off of slightly elevated surface like this, uh, that'll help teach you how to get in the right position. Sometimes we're doing uh, certain movements uh, basically just to uh, try to teach or reinforce a uh, certain form or technique. So back away from the bar a little bit. Uh, not that far. Yeah, like chop your foot in half. Yeah, yeah. you're going to have the barbell is kind of uh, right on top of your shoes. Looks like it's kind of chopping your, your feet uh, directly in half there. And you want to give yourself a little bit of uh, room because otherwise, once you move your uh, shins forward, once you drive your knees forward, uh, your shins are going to actually move the barbell uh, forward or some of your energy will be spilled out that way. Squat down. You drive those knees forward. Knees forward. Knees forward. There you go. Pull from there. There you go. Yep. And sometimes a simple correction too is try to keep your chin down a little bit more. So a lot of times people are trying to get a flat back because they're trying to like arch their chest up and maybe do a little bit too much crazy stuff with their neck. Chin down more. There you go. Pull from there. Good. The more. The more. Uh, the more you try to get yourself into a position that your body will not be able to maintain, the more your body is going to revolt against that positioning. So you need to find something, even though all this is extremely uncomfortable and it hurts really bad, you have to try to find something, find a way that you can have a position that's strong and be able to maintain that position throughout the entire lift, whether it's bench press, squat, or deadlift. Question over here? Yeah, when you when I go heavier, my neck tends to like hold back. Can I pick it up? Um, best thing to do is uh, just start looking down and we go for like a mark signature look, the sexy double chin. <laughs> so you want to keep your eyes, uh, depending on uh, quite the double chin how speak. long your torso is and we kind of have to see you lift, but typically we'll say maybe three feet in front of you, in front of your toes, look right there the entire time, tuck that chin in and keep it there that whole lift. That's going to keep your back in a better position. It's also going to keep you from getting all ranky and yeah, yeah. jacking up your traps. Okay. About how much can you deadlift? Uh, I just, like, two weeks ago, it was, like, 225. Would you mind trying one with uh, one plate? We can yeah. see. All right. Come on up here. Nothing to it but to do it. There you go. So you were kind of saying that, like, a lot of times when you go to pull on the bar, but the first thing that happens is your hips shoot up and then the weights leave the floor sort of thing? Or like, when I, especially when I go heavier, like I, especially when I go heavier, like I feel like I'm gonna like, if I pull my head back, it'll go like faster. Okay. Like that. Okay, the first thing is, um, go ahead and put the weight down for a second. So the first thing is that she is uh, able to get her hips really low, which is really cool. And it's a good way to pull because you're able to get your legs involved in a lift. But a deadlift is really like a hip movement more so than anything. And you're trying to minimize the amount of movement that you have. And so again, 
uh, the more you try to force yourself into some sort of weird position, the more your body's going to revolt against what you're trying to do. So rather than squat down so much, just leave your butt higher to begin with. So think about this for a second. If your butt shoots up, let's say your butt every time shoots up to about here, every time you go to do a deadlift, why not just fucking start with it right there? Get yourself tight and just leave your hips high. Uh, I've seen a lot of people pull huge weights with their hips high, so there's really nothing wrong with having your hips high. Again, you do want your hips to be at least slightly lower uh, than your shoulders, and you want your back to be flat, but as long as we try to get uh, within those two rules, then we're good. So go ahead and do it again and just leave your hips higher. There you go, a little better. First thing to do is just to bend right from your hips when you go to, go to grab the bar. So rather than squatting down, just bend right from the hips, just bend straight down. There you go. And then now pull yourself into position just slightly and then rip the weight off the ground. So am I too high still or too low? No, right there is fine. Yep. Yeah, that's all, that's all it needs to be. So you might have to kind of relearn how to pull from that position since okay. it's totally new for you. I feel like my, my butt is like higher than my shoulders. That's like... It's not. No. Okay. <laughs> no. We have video true. proof. Okay. Of your butt. Alright, thank you. And your shoulders. Huh? Next question. Yeah. Um, what do you guys do? Uh, what, do you, what do you guys do to to kind of deal and cope with like like just like a shitty day, like a shitty workout? You know, you may be just grinding out reps. Okay. The first thing that happens is. Seven Eleven. You get in your car and you start crying. <laughs> a beautiful song comes on. You can't help it. You had a shitty day. You start crying. Next thing you know. You're on your couch, watching Biggest Loser, <laughs> eating Ben and Jerry's, and you threw away the lids. You have no intention of fucking saving any of it. That's usually what we do. The only way to salvage uh, a shitty day, uh, there's, there's kind of just two things you can do. I mean, number one is you can leave the fucking gym because uh, usually once you're really up against it and like if you actually had a shitty day, like other shitty things happen to you, in your life rather than just a training session. And when you go in, you're like, fuck my life, my life sucks, I'm gonna go in and train, and I'm gonna escape from all this fucking bullshit, and I'm gonna go lift, and I'm gonna feel better. And then you go to lift, and you lift like a pussy, and you feel 10 times worse. A lot of times, the only thing you can do is just to leave the gym, and just consider it a loss, and uh, you know, just try to you know, li live to lift another day, basically. Um, and then the other thing that you can do is you can try to salvage the day early, you have to salvage the day before it becomes a big problem. So if your goal was to deadlift 500 for the day and you really had your heart set on it, your mind set on it for months and months and months, that you were absolutely positively going to deadlift 500 pounds, and when you got to 455, you barely locked it out, you should learn your lesson that adding more weight is not going to make you feel better. <laughs> Every once in a while, with a top level lifter, they will add more weight and they'll smash it because it was like a technique flaw. But normally, under normal circumstances, uh, most people, uh, when, they, when something's really hard, it's just gonna keep getting worse. So in that scenario, what I said earlier, the only way to get a PR in the gym every single time you walk in, other than using anabolic steroids, is to do something you've never done before. So in that case, you do 455 for one, and you lift like shit, and it's crappy, and then you think, all right, well, I'm gonna try to come back and do uh, you know, 405 or seven or something, something different, something that you haven't really tried before. Yeah, I liken it to uh, being injured. You know, if you, if you start to focus on, oh, I can't deadlift today, my back hurts, this weight feels heavy, focus on what you can do. Maybe you can block pull, maybe you can front squat, maybe you can go and pause squat. Um, like Mark said, it's easy to get down on yourself. Like, oh, I pulled 500 two weeks ago and now, now 450 feels like shit. That's just part of this lifting journey. Like it's, it, it, the better you get, the more shit days you have. You know, you, there's very few days, especially Mark, we train together every day. <laughs> he comes in the gym and, and I can look on his face and everything fucking hurts. He's, he can't tie his shoe, he's crying. My face is that ugly. Yeah. see how much pain I'm in. He, he hired me to tie his shoe. That's, That's like all I'm here for. He can't even bend over. And to wipe my ass. <laughs> wow. But with baby wipes. <laughs> yeah, so we once you start, <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, if your elbow's banged up, oh, I can't bench. Well, maybe you can do dumbbell bench. Maybe you can do slingshot bench. Maybe you can do arms. Maybe you can do shoulders. Maybe you can't do anything, and then it's time to be really sad. I'm having a hard time getting my bench up. I used to be in the service. I got stabbed, so I had to get 70 staples across my chest. So I could only bench 290. 
I tried my best, you know, I check all the YouTube videos, I can't get my bench up. So I'm, I'm glad you brought this up. Has anybody dead. else in here been stabbed and they're having trouble getting their bench up? Probably, probably a lot of you, right? Yeah. Jesus Christ, man, I'm sorry to hear that. That's, just, that's terrible. Well, it's kind of dead, so like I don't feel it when it bench. I, I'll right. never get a chest pump. I, mean, I could get kicked by a silent yeah. mic and I wouldn't feel it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Silent Mike is a ninja. I don't know if you want to really mess with him. Um, you know, the thing about strength training, what I love about powerlifting uh, so much is that we all possess the, the ability to get stronger. And whether you've been stabbed or whether this happened or that happened, you, there's, you're always able to get better than where you're currently at. Whether it's to get a little bit leaner or to gain a little bit of strength. There's always some room uh, to get a little stronger. So we already know that what you're currently doing is not giving you the results that you want. So if you're doing like low repetitions, a simple thing would be to change to higher repetitions. And you may say, ah, I tried all that before, but you have to really stick with something for a period of time. I would say like a four to six week period of, of really giving something a chance uh, before you flip flop or before you say it doesn't work. Um, you can try to incorporate a lot of dumbbell work. You can try to incorporate things like dips. You can try to incorporate things like push-ups. Push-ups and dumbbell work have always worked for people's bench press for years, uh, with maybe the exception of some of the people that are really uh, kind of at the top of the food chain when it comes to bench pressing. Uh, push-ups might become ineffective to them at some point, and even dumbbells with 200 pounds might be ineffective for someone like Eric Spoto, who's, who's bench pressed 722 pounds. But we just had Eric Spoto at Super Training Gym, and the take home message from him was to get big and try to work on gaining size and, and uh, getting a hypertrophy. Some of you guys saw how pathetic that picture was with my arm next to his. Talking the most embarrassing day in my life. But that's a big motherfucker, you know? Uh, and you want to try to continue to work on building size. And if, you're gonna, if that's the goal and that's what you want to do, then it doesn't just end with the weights that you're lifting. It has to carry over into your nutrition and your diet and, and your, your diet. food. And your food. There we go. It's going to have to carry over into everything that you're doing, uh, all the way into uh, making sure you're getting enough rest and stuff like that. So uh, try to uh, take what you're doing currently and just do the opposite of it for a little while and see where that takes you. So a couple times doing deadlifts, I feel like I've gone too fast and I've injured my back in the, in the process. And so I just wanted to get some feedback on how fast is too fast. What are some things that these guys do like in between every single rep yeah. that maybe I'm not seeing and should pay uh, attention one to? Of the, one of the most effective ways uh, to uh, slow down your speed work is to add more weight. <laughs> uh, when I used to do speed work for bench press, uh, I became actually a little bit I became a little bit faster uh, than I was strong almost, and I was able to really crank into the weight all the way to the point where it hurt my elbows, it hurt my shoulders. I couldn't sleep at night because my shoulders were aching all the time, my elbows were aching all the time. And something very simple that I did was I was like, you know what, I'm just mo I'm moving uh, at such a, a fast speed that it's not safe for my joints, it's not safe for my body. So I simply just added weight and that allowed me to slow down a little bit. Uh, not to get too complex with the whole thing, but you know, force is mass times acceleration. So what you're really trying, you're, you're, you're not only after just moving the bar fast, but you're after trying to have some mass on the bar as well. If you read any of the old stuff about like compensatory acceleration, is basically the idea of just trying to move the bar fast. It's the intent behind it and not so much how fast it actually moves. So like uh, if we loaded it up to uh, 400 pounds and you can't move it very fast, but I just yelled and screamed at you to move it as fast as you can, uh, that's a little bit more effective than just trying to pull on it and barely making a 405 lift. You want to try to have the intent of being fast and being explosive, uh, but for you, you might have to use a little bit more weight. Thank you. And you got to always make sure that your form is locked in too. You don't want to just go berserk on something and, and, and uh, move so fast that you pull yourself out of position. You gotta always try to maintain position. Uh, any other questions? Next up, there we go. A uh, couple couple months ago, I got injured doing uh, doing conventional deadlifts, and I used to pull sumo when I was working on my conventional, and I had a pretty high, pretty decent sumo for my weight, 
but I injured myself and now the sumo feels uncomfortable and I'm working on my conventional, but sometimes I just don't feel like my form's there. You're gonna have to uh, just continue to try to hit things from different angles. Your sumo pull feels awkward, is that what you said? Now it does, yeah. I, I, would, I would work on something like a box squat for a few weeks with a wider stance. Okay. You know, try to find a few movements that you can do with a wider stance. You could even uh, just be like squatting a kettlebell or something like that. The kettlebell's not heavy enough. You could put a band around the kettlebell and run, a, run the band uh, through your feet and get in a kind of a wide stance, real upright position, yeah. and try to pull that way. You want to try to build up your quads and build up some strength uh, in that sumo position. I've tried a couple other things other than just actually deadlifting from that position. Was, uh, just try to focus on like why did you get injured? Was it form? Was it strength? Was it uh, nutrition? Diet? Food? <laughs> all of the above, and then try to fix it. Maybe it's mobility, maybe it's just strength, you know? So like Mark said, a couple different exercises, but uh, lifting from elevated surface can help um, if it's a mobility issue. A lot of guys can get in a way better position off blocks. That's why we overload, that's why you, you use it, because you can, less range of motion, get a better position. Um, check stuff like that. And then I would still try to train both. Maybe, maybe uh, widen your stance on sumo or a narrower, or whatever might work, but it's gonna take years. I mean, Mark changes his stance every week it seems yeah. like yeah. just to figure out what feels better that day or what's stronger that day just keep working on it yeah yeah just changing everything yeah what if it's a personal uh form thing i think we're going to lift in a little bit and we can come check everybody's form but um Great. yeah well, you can also just try to uh, deadlift with a wider stance for a little while you know your sumo stance take it out a little wider help build up your hips but that's what the box squat will do as well you know a lot of times uh, you know this huge shift towards raw lifting uh some people have forgotten about some great exercises and some great things that have made people strong uh, before the raw revolution uh, started to hit. Box squats are still very effective. They are different, it's a different movement, so you don't wanna take your box squat strength and, and uh, have that be what your opener at a contest, that would be stupid. You wanna make sure that you know what you can squat without the box, but it's still a great movement. It's still utilized by a lot of great lifters. Any other questions? Anybody have any other questions? What we got back there? With the bench, having problems staying tight, what's the best way to work on finding a way to stay tight and stay locked in? There, you know, there's like a checklist that you have to go through uh, no matter what lift it is, whether it's bench squat or deadlift. Uh, in the case of the bench press, what we're trying to do is we're trying to limit the range of motion. We're trying to pull our shoulder blades back a little bit. We're trying to get a little bit of an arch, uh, mainly to the upper back. I'm not really a big fan of trying to arch the lower back. I actually think it's uh, it's not as effective for being able to push all the way through uh, on a heavy bench press, but you want to try to arch your upper back. You're trying to pull your chest up. It's very common amongst uh, all three lifts uh, that you're, um, it's something common amongst the three lifts that you want to try to keep your chest up on all three of them, whether it's bench, squat, or deadlift. The bench press, you're trying to keep your chest up. You're trying to limit that range of motion. Uh, the best way, in my opinion, to get yourself tight on the bench press uh, is to simply utilize the bar, just like we do in the deadlift, and kind of like we do in the squat. Utilize the bar to allow yourself to get into proper position. So if we can have this guy here demonstrate. Um, he, you know, pretty much every lifter utilizes the bar to get themselves in position. Um, and everybody has a little, there's some slightly different uh, techniques to it. But see how he uh, lined up Sorry, wait, okay, come up here a little bit more. See how he, um, see how he kind of lined up with his head uh, almost off the bench a little bit, okay? And now he's got, he's got good positioning here from his legs. He's got good positioning here from his shoulders, and there's space here. That's what we should have. We should have some space there. It's not like he's intentionally trying to do anything crazy with his lower back. It's just that he's simply you know, pinching his shoulder blades together really hard. Some people stay down there. Some people will uh, also turn their hands over the other way, like that, and they'll start out higher on the bench that way, and, and they'll pull themselves into position this way. You know, each person's gonna have different, you know, different uh, mobility issues. <laughs> yeah, it's like Each person's gonna have different limitations as far as that goes, but it's a very simple way to just kind of pull yourself into position and to make sure that you're kind of locking your shoulder blades in. Uh, another great way to kind of learn the feel of any particular movement, whether it's bench, squat, or deadlift, is to uh, use something to kind of pre-fatigue you. Do some uh, face pulls, very common movement. 
uh, just try to pull a band or uh, you know take a cable and try to pull a cable towards your face for about 20 reps. Try to get some uh, blood flow, get a little bit of a pump, and then do your bench press in between. You should kind of feel your upper back being lit up between you holding it statically like this and you doing your range of motion like that with some resistance. Any other questions? Got more questions? How do you feel about quick powerlifting, like single ply, today and today? What's that? How do you feel about equipped powerlifting? Like, what are your thoughts on it? Geared powerlifting. Yeah, geared powerlifting. Yeah, geared powerlifting. You know, unfortunately, it's uh, it sort of died out a little bit. Um, you know, I, I miss some of the the, uh, the old powerlifting. You know, guy, the guys were chasing down a thirteen hundred pound squat for a little while, but I think you know a combination of things happened. Uh, people started to have started to wear too much powerlifting gear, uh, and the rules started to get bent, started to really bend a lot uh, with the amount, with the depth that people were doing with, were hitting, and with the the, uh, the type of benches that people were doing. They weren't quite locking them out the same way they were uh, years before. So unfortunately, I think geared powerlifting has uh, kind of died out, but I actually think that it will still come back. Uh, the USAPL is the strongest uh, federation that there is, and I think that uh, the USAPL still has a great representation of single ply powerlifting. And I think that uh, once all the raw people are broken down and beat up, they'll probably start putting powerlifting gear on again. Uh, so, what do you do uh, nutrition wise to get stronger? Go ahead, silent mic. Um, I think the key uh, for nutrition to get stronger is, is obviously protein intake is going to be important. And if your only goal is to get stronger, then you're going to have to eat a lot of food and any food you can see. Um, obviously, you know, McDonald's every day is probably not going to be the best, uh, but you're, you can't really lack any like macronutrient. You're going to have to eat quite a bit of fat, you know, a moderate fat diet, fairly uh, high carb if you're training pretty heavy, and then obviously high protein. Uh, I'm a big fan of tracking what I eat. Uh, it just keeps me consistent. Kind of these other issues we talk about, you know, guys are stalling in their bench press. If you're stalling in your bench press, you don't know what you're eating, your sleep's inconsistent, you don't <clears throat> hydrate regularly, then you don't know which factor it is. Is it my training? Is it my hydration? Is it my food? Is it my sleep? You have to change all of them to make sure your bench goes up. Well, I make sure I sleep enough, I track my food to make sure it's consistent. Sleep's all that every day. Yeah, often. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, and then I carry this stupid jug of water around to make sure I'm hydrated. So when my bench plateaus, I know it's because of uh, something I'm doing in the gym. Control as many factors as you can, and then you can fix the ones that need some help. More questions over there. You were just talking about wearing too much power with the mirror. You were disqualified for wearing a bench shirt, supposedly, while I was deadlifting. Would you say that wearing my reactive slingshot would help my deadlift? Might, yeah, actually a slingshot can help you if you put it behind your back. Oh, yeah. That's another story for another day. Yeah, you know, I would lift it uh, in a federation uh, that was that was called the USPF, and it turned into the USPA, uh, and for some reason, uh, when I tried to break a record, they accused me of wearing a bench shirt during a deadlift. I don't know how that happened, but a lot of weird shit happened when I jumped into a single ply powerlifting. I had people uh, checking out my bench shirts. I had uh, three judges surround me while I was putting on a bench shirt, even though they already checked my bench shirt at the gear check, and they had they put a big check mark on it. They still surrounded me and were looking at my bench shirt because I was just lifting more than other people. So, well, so you used the squat suit to bench, right? Ah, yeah, of course, of course, of course. Well, why not? Yeah, why not? Use whatever you can. Use whatever you can. Powerlifting is not about federations, you know. It's I, I hear people ask about different federations. Powerlifting is about you guys. Powerlifting is about the lifters and being able to have the best opportunity to lift the most amount of weight under the safest conditions. That's all it's about. Not about anything more than that. So you don't have to have like loyalty towards one thing or the other. It doesn't really matter. Any other questions? More questions? What do we got? I was a beginner. I was doing deadlift. Every time I tried to get my back straight, I feel like my back is just rounded, just like that. So what can I do? Come on over here. Let's, try, let's have you line up on a deadlift over here. Your back's uh, rounding over quite a bit when you deadlift, is what you said? So before we actually do a deadlift, let's just have you uh, just back away from the barbell a little bit. And let's just have you try to get your back flat. So uh, turn this way towards me, okay? And just bow like this. Okay, you're already rounded, okay? And, we, and we're not under any sort of weight yet, okay? So you need to keep your shoulders kind of even with your hips. You follow me, right? Shoulders even with your hips. 
and then you're going to kind of take your uh, middle finger and you're going to bring it down towards your knees. Yeah. Okay? Can you, can you feel, go ahead and do it again. Can you feel your spine rounding here? Are you able to pull your chest up from this position? More? <laughs> More? Okay. And now bend your knees a little bit. And now bend from the bend from the hips more down towards the floor with your arms. Okay, let's straighten your legs out a little bit more. Straighten your legs out a little bit more. Straighten them out more. So now we're kind of starting to get into what would look like a deadlift position. Does this feel different than what you were doing before? Yeah. Okay. Let's let's try to do that with the bar. So don't fuck it up. I'm counting on you. We got cameras, we got a fucking audio guy here. This is some serious shit. Yeah. Pretty good, pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. Stay with it, stay with it, stay with it, stay with it. How do we get to the bar? How do we get to the bar? How do we get to the bar? Go ahead, pick it up. There we go. I mean, bad. It's a lot better than where we started, right? Yeah. One thing you have to try to do is you really want to try to just bend right from here, okay? You want to kind of hinge from the hips. Um, some people will watch me lift and be like, your back never rounds. It's only because I can't move. <laughs> it's because I'm, it's I'm too, too uh, stiff. Not necessarily a good thing, but and you want to try to just kind of bend from here, and you're kind of getting into this position here, and you'll grab the weight and then pick it up from there. Okay. Go ahead and try it one more time. So this time, let's have you try something just a little different. Let's have you just bend from here, okay? Let's have you get to the bar this way with your knees a little straighter, okay? And then we're going to use the bar to get in position. That bar is really low to the ground for some reason on these. It seems to be moving further and further away all the time. There we go. Okay, bend the knees a little bit, a little bit more. But we need to pull this up. Hands wider. There we go. And pull right from there. Stay tight. There we go. Good. There we go. Good fucking job. You didn't blow it. Thank you. <laughs> all right, next. You know, more questions? Can you give us some tips or pointers for stretching? I know I almost always forget to stretch. You forget to stretch? <laughs> Holy shit. I'm just so excited to... It's like a boxer forgetting his boxing gloves. Right? Um, you know, I'm not a huge fan of, uh, of, of stretching. Um, just because it's not my thing. I like to lift heavy weights, you know? Stretching is extremely beneficial, though. I know a lot of lifters, even the great Ed Cohn, the greatest power lifter of all time, he used to stretch after every single workout. There's always a big debate on whether you should stretch before your workout or stretch after, you know, all these different things. But... I really think that you should try to do what makes you feel better. And if you notice a change, and you, and you notice a change uh, that's a positive change, then you should try to stick with it. Um, as far as actual stretching, I don't think it's important to do a ton of stretching before you work out. I do think it's important to uh, get a good warm up in and to mobilize your body uh, through activity and through movement rather than actually like just stretching, bending down towards, you know, touching your toes. Uh, a lot of times in our gym, you know, if we're going to squat, we'll warm up with squats. Uh, it might be like a body weight squat, or it might squat on a bench, or squat on a box, uh, or walk with the hip circle for a little bit. Something to kind of uh, get your hips uh, loosened up. Um, you know, a very old and uh, very tried and true method is to go on a stationary bike for a few minutes. You know, people kind of forget, uh, strength training's been around forever, it's not new. It might be new to some of us in the room here, and it may be new to some people on the internet. But it's been around for a very long time. And some tried and true methods are to simply just get your body warm before you start your activity. If you go into the gym and you're cold and you're stiff from previous workouts, it's going to be very hard to get yourself warmed up under a 135-pound bar, uh, especially if you've been training for a while. The stronger you get, the worse that feeling kind of becomes because your body gets stiffer over the years. But if you simply just hop on a stationary bike and do it for 10, 15 minutes, uh, that'll make you feel a lot better. Um, if you want to start to get into stretching because you don't feel uh, that you're mobile enough, I would look at a lot of the work that Kelly Sturette does. He has a book called Becoming a Supple Leopard. I think he had a second edition of it just come out recently. Uh, he's brilliant. He has a website called mobilitywad.com. I plug him all the time. Uh, he is a friend of mine, but that's not the only reason why I plug him. I plug him because he's fucking awesome at what he does. He knows a lot more about the human body and human movement than I'll ever understand. 
Other questions? So uh, from a coaching aspect, like obviously you guys are able to get people to lift a lot of big numbers, and if they've never lifted before, they get excited about it. What do you tell them once they realize, like after a few weeks, that they're not like, oh, I, I keep making PRs like every week. What's the, like, how do you talk them like through that process? Yeah, yeah you know, your gains are gonna come uh, really fast, your gains with a Z, hashtag, right? All these things are important, don't forget to put that on there. Um, you know, your gains are gonna come fast uh, in the very beginning, because everything's new to you, it's a new stimulus. Uh, and sometimes you'll get someone who starts to get frustrated that they're not getting those same gains. They're not gaining 10 pounds, 20 pounds uh, every single week on their lifts. Uh, this is a long journey. It takes a long time. Uh, if you want to be good at something, like I always say, it might only take you a little bit of time. If you want to be great at something, it's going to take you a very long time. And it's going to take you many, many months and many, many years to build strength. Strength training, becoming stronger doesn't happen overnight. It's a long journey. And it's something like Mike was pointing out earlier. You have to try to make sure everything's intact. So if it's a newer person and you're just getting them just to the gym and they're getting excited about that, then the conversation starts to become, well, what the hell else are you doing with the other you know, 23 hours a day that you have? Are you getting enough rest? Are you eating properly? Are you doing this properly, that properly? Drinking enough water? You know, just simple. Sometimes it's something simple. Uh, are they recovering from their workouts? You know, because sometimes uh, the workouts start to become more intense. You're not recovering from them very well. But those are all things that you have to kind of start to ask the person. If those things aren't in line, then it kind of starts to give you an idea of how serious they really are or really aren't about the process of becoming stronger. Other questions? More questions. We need more questions. Just make one up. Okay, he says you know his back is really bothering. His back is super tight. A very common problem, not not just amongst uh, beginners, but amongst uh, people that have been lifting for years and years. The main thing on something like that is I always feel that if there's a problem with an area, the best thing to do is rather than try to back off from that area, the best thing to do is to go in and attack it and try to find out what exercises will start to make it feel better. Uh, if, there's a, if, if you find something and there's somewhat of a positive change, you want to try to stick with that. Sounds like a simple concept, but not everyone adheres to it. Um, doing things like stiff leg deadlifts, uh, 45 degree back raise, the reverse hyperextension is extremely therapeutic uh, for your lower back. Um, doing, you know, training, your, training your abs, training your stomach, a lot of those different types of things are going to help your lower back um, if you're trying to if you're trying to deadlift heavier and heavier progressively and your back keeps bothering you then you have to learn from that and you're gonna have to say okay well that's just not working for me maybe you have to work with 135 pounds for a few months until your back starts to feel a little bit better uh, when I was I think I was 20 years old I herniated a disc in my back I could barely even go to the bathroom without having tons of pain Imagine that, I shit like 13 times a day. And I, I can't shit without pain, I am miserable. Uh, you know, you're gonna run into these injuries, you're gonna run into these problems. And, and what I did, uh, you know, the doctors told me to stay off my feet for a long time. I stopped training for a little while, that didn't help. It made it worse, things locked up on me even worse, got to the point where it was hard to even get out of bed. And I said, you know, fuck it, I'm gonna go back to the gym. And like Mike pointed out earlier, concentrate on the things that you can do rather than some of the things that you can't do. And by focusing in on that and then starting to say, you know what, I probably just need to strengthen my back once it started to feel just even a little bit better. Uh, then I started to work my back more and it started to progressively get better and better. So there's not really a lot of great stretches that are gonna like really cure your back. Although sometimes people have uh, tight hips um, and you know you can do some stretches for your hips. Again, mobilitywide.com is a great reference point for that. Um, but going in and attacking it and making your back stronger. Strength is never a weakness. No one's ever regretted getting stronger, right? I say it all the time. You heard it a million times, right? Uh, you want to try to make that area stronger and hopefully the pain will subside. More questions? More questions? The second question now. But how do you work on improving your grip strength when you want to work on these heavier deadlifts? I mean, I know I see a lot of the guys using straps, but yeah. is there anything else just beyond trying to lift heavy? So sometimes, you know, uh, first of all, using straps is going to help strengthen your lower back. 
It's going to allow you to handle more weight. Same thing with using a belt. These things will allow you to handle more weight. When you go to use a lighter weight, you'll be able to move it faster. A lot of times your grip strength comes down to how long it takes you to complete the lift. So if you're trying to deadlift 600 pounds and it takes you four and a half seconds to finish it and it slips out of your hands at the very top, I guarantee you if you were able to do the lift in four seconds, half second faster, you would be able to complete the lift without any real issues of your grip. Um, grip strength and grip, uh, grip training is, is neglected by nearly every power lifter and, and nearly every, well strong man guys have to really pay attention to it, so not so much with strong man, but uh, there's simple things you can do for your grip. You can do hex dumbbell holds, uh, holding, holding uh, weights at the top uh, has been very effective for a lot of people, so you, when you do a deadlift, you simply just hold the weight at the top. At our gym, we do a lot of double overhand deadlifting until our grip starts to give out. We just try to do that with as heavy a weight as we possibly can. And for each guy, it's different. Some guys are better at it than others. Uh, you can use uh, fat, uh, fat bars. Those work pretty good. Uh, there's all kinds of different things you can do for your grip. But think, a lot of times, things like pull-ups and things like heavy seated rows, heavy one-arm dumbbell rows, along with heavy deadlifting, for most people, a lot of times that's enough for their grip to uh, get strong. But I would still recommend grip you know, some regular grip work because uh, I think that the way that 135 feels in your hands is a lot different than as the weights start to get heavier and your heaviest weight, you know, it's going to start to feel a lot different on your hands. You'll notice when somebody does a max deadlift that the weights uh, always slip a little bit out of their hands, even if they're not going to actually lose the bar. And that changes the positioning of your back, it changes the positioning of everything. So, you know, add some sort of grip training to your workouts. Like I said, holding the deadlifts on top would be really effective for people. I know Ed Cohn used to do the, uh, he'd do a one-arm deadlift out of a rack, and he would just, uh, with a regular barbell, he'd load the thing up to around 225 pounds and just kind of do a one-arm, kind of like a side bend. He used to do that movement a lot, and that was really effective for his grip. Along with uh, the Gillingham brothers, Brad Gillingham, did an 881-pound deadlift, double overhand grip. Uh, heaviest deadlift, I think, ever done in the USAPL, or at least one, one of the top three. Uh, he did a lot of... Uh, just, uh, just hanging on a chin-up bar and, uh, and doing uh, leg lifts, you know, training his abs. So while he's training his abs, he's still getting the grip working. Uh, what's, your, uh, what's your bench press program? Um, you know, my, my training uh, is, is pretty much always similar. I have, like I said earlier, I have a max effort day, a day that I go heavy, and I have a speed day. Um, over the last few years, uh, I used to change up that max effort lift uh, a lot more often. Um, but now I kind of change it up with repetitions, uh, pause work, non-pause work, slingshot, non-slingshot. Um, so the, the actual, like, pro, I don't have an actual program. Uh, I've always kind of felt like a, like a program doesn't fit uh, my, my mindset very well. I have to do a lot of different things and have a lot of different stimulus in order for me to be uh, successful. So I've done a lot of different types of things, but a lot of triples, a lot of doubles, a lot of singles. Sometimes sets of five, uh, along with that. That's my heavy, uh, heavy day, and then I, I have a speed day that I've always been a huge fan of. Uh, usually go hard on the speed day for two or three weeks at a time. And then I'll have to kind of switch it up because it will start to beat the hell out of my shoulders and stuff like that. Uh, dumbbell work's always been a big part of uh, of my bench pressing program, but in my opinion, if you're going to be good at something, it has to be overtrained. So you look at uh, guys that have big squats, guys that have big squats have big quads because they train the shit out of their legs. A lot of times you ask someone, what do you do for your legs? And they'll tell you and it'll be like you know, 20 sets of legs, right? They'll do a leg press and squats and lunges and this and that. And same thing with bench press. I used to do like 23 sets of bench press uh, every single work guy did that for a few years. And so most of the people you talk to that are strong at something, they overtrain the shit out of it at some point. Do you, have ever, do you ever have issues with like head or face pressure once you get closer to your max? Face pressure. Face pressure. <laughs> where, is, where is that? Look at that. There's some face pressure for you. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> when, when I first started to get into multi-ply lifting, uh, you know, I'd have a ton of pressure in my face. I'd blow out my eyeballs a little bit here and there. Uh, I'd blow out my face. My face would get like uh, just... <laughs> like uh, break blood vessels in my face. Um, I used to break bus blood vessels in my eye. I'm actually uh, like 
partially blind in this left side right here. So if you want to hit me with a hook, you can. And that's from squatting heavy. That's from all the pressure. At least I think that's what it's from. Um, but in uh, with raw powerlifting, I never had any of those issues um, because I just don't think I've ever handled enough weight. You know, maybe somebody like Eric Lillibridge or something is handling enough weight to where he'd be able to uh, have a better idea of that. Some guys you'll see, you know, they'll bust their nose or whatever. I never really had uh, any issues with that. Sometimes uh, the pressure, uh, when people get headaches and different things like that, uh, can be due to how they carry the bar on their back in a squat. And then also, if you end up kind of looking like you're throwing up in a toilet bowl every time you do a squat, like I do sometimes, sometimes that puts a ton of pressure uh, into your face and into your head. And you want to kind of make sure you're actually taking air. When you take your air in for any of the big lifts, you want to try to take air into your stomach and kind of push your stomach outward, but not try to take air into your face. Don't take air into your face. Uh, I got two questions. Mike was talking about tracking his nutrition. On a good day, how many calories do you consume? And then my other question is, how do you keep the strongest gym on the West open without charging membership fees? Go ahead and answer question number one, Mike. Can you hear me? If you smile! Um, in terms of tracking on, nutrition, it's going to be so independent of yourself. I don't even want to like give out my calories just because like uh, uh, you could, there almost could be my genetic twin right here. Another whatever 200 pound guy, whatever body fat, whatever height, ethnicity, just as good looking as me here. And we're going to eat different. Um, what I suggest to do is start tracking. Track 10 days. Average out your calories. Weigh yourself every single day. If you gained weight, then and that's your goal, then great. You can stay on that path. If you maintain weight, then that's your goal, whatever. And you'll have to adjust from there. Uh, typically, anywhere from maybe um, 12 to 14 times your body weight. That'll kind of be your calories, depending how active you are. A lot of people have desk jobs. You're going to have to go more like 12 to 10. Um, if you're in the gym all day long or training for four hours every single day, maybe it'll be more like 14 to 15. How do you figure out if that's working? Uh, check your scale, check the mirror, ask your girlfriend or boyfriend. Weigh yourself, right? Send uh, smelly uh, private <laughs> naked DMs. That'd be great. I do get some of those. <laughs> uh, and then uh, super training uh, has become free a few years ago uh, because of you guys. Thank everybody in here uh, for all your support. Everybody who supported the slingshot, everybody who's wearing a pair of Reebok kicks, anybody who's wearing anything from Super Training Gym, thank you very much. And that's why the gym is able to be free, is because of the huge fan base that the Slingshot has. And uh, it's been a dream of mine since I was a kid to be able to uh, afford to be able to have a gym uh, that is free. Um, the way that it stays free is because powerlifting is really fucking hard. And uh, we have the same amount of members no matter what it seems like. I don't know how that happens, but people tend to weed themselves out. Um, you know, the, tra the training is hard and people are trying to be focused and people are trying to be, take it uh, at least somewhat seriously. Um, and people are trying to get better. And so uh, because of that, you know, people that are kind of hiding off in the corner or not training hard or people that want to be assholes, they're just not going to survive in there. I've never had to kick anybody out, really. People kind of kick themselves out. So that's how it's able to stay free. Thank you. Are there any exercises or like specific mobility work that you'd recommend outside of face pulls to keep your shoulders healthy on bench? So like, I mean, I know that like having proper form really protects your shoulders, um, but like even if you're careful, you can still hurt yourself, right? So. Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, one, one of the best things for form is to get bigger. And one of the other best things for form is to get stronger. Uh, the best form in the world on a fucking bench press is Eric Spoto. And it's no coincidence that he's the strongest guy in the bench press. He has the best form. He's able to stabilize the weight the best. Um, but Eric Spoto, you know, he, he's a different kind of guy. Like a lot of the, a lot of power lifters don't really take care of uh, all the little things that are necessary, all the little things that you need to take care of in order to stay healthy. Even though he, he did uh, just recently have a shoulder surgery. Uh, Eric's very meticulous with his training. He does a lot of rotator cuff work. He, do, he just attacks everything from as many different angles as he can uh, to try to be better uh, at the bench press. Uh, for yourself, I mean, the first thing I would try to do is try to gain some weight. But the second thing I would do is uh, start to work on some rotator cuff work. 
Um, something like a Cuban press is a really good movement. If you don't know what it is, just look it up. Um, it's just basically you're just trying to pull the weight up to, it's like it starts like an upright row, and you just kind of rotate it back. Uh, the reason why I think that's effective is just because it's kind of getting uh, two different motions of the shoulder in there, and it's a little bit better than just doing regular regular rotator cuff work. You're not really able to use much weight, um, but a little bit of that can go a long way as well. I just try to attack your shoulders from many different angles. Uh, you can even kind of um, uh, start to pre-fatigue your shoulders with some different movements. Uh, move, you know, something I used to do a while back is I would do, you know, 20 reps of front raises, 20 reps of side raises, and then 20 reps of, uh, you know, bent over uh, lateral raises. Something like that to just really get your shoulders on fire. The shoulder is kind of a weird thing to really hit. And same with your hip. They're very similar in a lot of ways. Both of them are really hard to, to really nail down. But uh, just try to incorporate a lot of different exercises for your shoulders including uh, something like an overhead press, uh, but also look into some uh, rotator cuff work. When you do bed squat and deadlift, the days that you lift those, do you do accessory movements after the lifts? Or do you have separate days for your accessories? Yeah, you know, I, I've never been a fan of uh, doing too many different lifts uh, on the same day. I'm just, I just don't have the energy for it. I'm a fat boy at heart. I want to go home and eat. But, um, you know, I only hit like three to five exercises on a given day. Uh, someone like Mike, Mike likes to do a little bit more. He might hit, what, six or seven exercises on a given day, depending on the day. I think the biggest difference is I'll hit more barbell than you will. Right. Yeah, yeah it just kind of depends on, you know, each person is a little different. Uh, but sometimes for myself, uh, when it comes to something like a bench press, I might bench press for like 90 minutes, you know, 60 or 90 minutes. And then what else is there left to do after that? Me and this guy here, my brother, he got me into powerlifting in the first place. Thank you, motherfucker. Fuck. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, we used to just, you know, bench, squat, and deadlift. That's all we did. We didn't really do uh, assistance movements that often. The assistance movements are crucial, uh, in a sense, to try to keep you healthy and to try to keep, uh, to try to keep you lean and keep you in shape and all those different kinds of things and to try to keep, your, uh, keep yourself looking jacked and tan. Um, but, uh, you know, I would say you know, three or four assistance movements are usually uh, good enough. Um, some of the favorites at our gym, on a, you know, on a deadlift day, a lot of the guys will do like a glute ham raises, reverse hypers, maybe some bent over rows, maybe a little lat work to go in with the back work. Um, upper body days, uh, slingshots, board presses, close grip bench presses. These are all kind of done after the main movement. Um, and then as far as like a squat goes, a lot of times it's squatting, followed by more squatting, followed by more squatting. Sometimes a good morning could be thrown in there. We recently got a thing called the Pit Shark, which is basically just a machine, that, a belt squat machine. So again, squatting, followed by more squatting. Something like a leg press can be really effective. We don't have one in my gym, so we don't use them. Um, but really, you know, just trying to, after you get done with your main movement, you're trying to think of what are some exercises that will help improve the movement that I just did. And when you're trying to think in those terms, that, that could be really broad because you can be thinking like, okay, I just bench pressed. Now I want to do my biceps. Why do I want to do my biceps? Because I want to try to increase the size of my biceps because the biceps will help act as kind of shock absorbers, brake pads uh, for the bench press. The bigger muscles going to be a stronger muscle. Um, when you have uh, bigger muscles or when you're heavier, uh, you'll be able to support more weight those have better leverages. So again, hypertrophy becomes a big part of it. You know, so are you trying to do a movement to gain hypertrophy and to get stronger through that avenue? Or are you trying to, to simply utilize a movement that's attacking a weakness? We train like every day, but I guess eventually we want to probably compete. What's your advice for somebody who's never competed? How do you break in? Uh, yeah. How do you sign up or whatever? Yeah, you know, if you're really apprehensive about it, if you're really, you know, terrified to do a powerlifting meet, um, I would say the, the best thing to do is just to go to a powerlifting meet, uh, try to go to a powerlifting gym and be around some powerlifters. Um, you know, some of the guys are, are pretty tough looking, pretty rugged looking, but for the most part, uh, other powerlifters want to see you succeed. They want you to jump into it so that we have more powerlifters and so that people can continue to grow and succeed. Um, if you go to a powerlifting meet, it'd probably be uh, a good way for you to uh, kind of see it firsthand, see how it goes. But really, you know, in my opinion, the absolute best way 
is just to find a con contest in your area. Uh, you can look at uh, PowerToThingWatch.com. has a lot of information about contests. A lot of times uh, friends and other powerlifters are posting stuff on social media. Find a competition in your area and just go do it. Just sign up for it and just go do it. Um, the best part about doing your first contest is there's nothing else to compare it to. So everything else, every single thing that you do for the day will be a PR. I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one that drove here uh, state to come see you, Silent Mike, all the other animals here at Barbell Brigade. Uh, are you planning on maybe thinking about opening up another super training gym in a different state? Uh, I don't have any plans to do so, uh, but a guy named Stan, the Rhino Efforting does. Uh, he's thinking about opening up a super training gym, possibly uh, in Las Vegas. We'll see what the fuck happens with that. <laughs> uh, what's your opinion on like Bulgarian style training for powerlifting, where you're like squatting to the training max every day? Just not a fan of it. I, I you know, I, I don't really, I, you know, if if something makes you feel good to try it and to do it, then do it. Who am I to tell you otherwise? Uh, also, you know, try stuff out for yourself and see how it works. Um, but you know, squatting every day, what is that going to do for your other two lifts? This is powerlifting. It requires you to do three lifts. And if you're only focused in on one thing, I don't really see how those other two things are going to like magically get better. Uh, however, again, you know, like, why not try it? You know, why not try something for a little while? I've tried everything. You know, pretty much everything you can think of. Uh, an inch on your arms in one day, try it. Obviously, it fucking worked. Look how impressive this is. 10 minute out.